Imagine you're a young med student thinking that you know exactly what kind of doctor you want to be and three days into the job, you realize it's not for you. Well, today I'm going to share the story on how I learned within just three days that emergency medicine was not for me. Hey friends, welcome back to the channel. Today is going to be another episode in the why I didn't kind of playlist or series that we're doing where I talk about all the specialties that I considered in medical school and residency that I ultimately elected not to pick and why. And today I'm going to break down the reasons that I didn't go into emergency medicine, which I really did strongly consider and took me just three days on the job to realize not for me. And as a full disclaimer, all of the reasons I chose not to pursue the field are my own. And so not only will I talk about the multiple reasons why I said no thanks, I'm also going to talk about who I think emergency medicine would be a great fit for. So make sure you stay tuned to the very end of the episode to catch those. And if you want to add to the conversation or if you feel like any of my points are misguided, definitely let me know in the comment section down below. But first we have to break down the story. Three days and saying no thanks to emergency medicine. How do we get there? So the last semester of my third year of medical school, I knew I had to make a decision on what specialty I wanted to pursue because when you're a fourth year medical student, that's when you're sending applications for residencies in whatever field that you ultimately apply for. And at that point, I was deciding between emergency medicine and internal medicine. Because ultimately, at that point, I was thinking that I wanted a career path would allow me to be a jack of all trades, know a little bit about everything, get really good at diagnosing and doing exams and interacting with patients. And those two fields, internal medicine and emergency medicine, seem to fit that boat. Now, compared to internal medicine, which is a lot more straightforward to apply to for residency, emergency medicine for medical students actually has a lot more hoops that you have to go into before you even get to the application phase. To convince potential residency programs that you're interested in emergency medicine and you're right fit for them, a few things that you have to do before you even apply include doing things like away rotations where you'll take a month and go to a different institution and spend time in their ER working as if you were going to be a future resident just so they can get a feel for what you're like. And usually for emergency medicine, you may have to do one, if not two, away rotations. That doesn't include any rotations that you do at your home institution in emergency medicine. So you're already starting the process with applications just for away rotations because those get competitive, especially for the good programs that everyone wants to go to then trying to coordinate your rest of your schedule amongst the months that you get, and that's not all. In addition to doing an away rotation, you also need specific kinds of letters from physicians in the emergency medicine department that says that this person is a great candidate, they wanna go into emergency medicine, essentially somebody who vouches for you more than just a letter of recommendation. And then finally, if your institution offers it, you should be doing something called a sub I rotation. This is a sub internship rotation that you do as a fourth year medical student, but you almost behave like you're a first year resident. You graduated medical school, and you're gonna be given more responsibilities just so you get a feel for what it's going to be like when you're first you're a doctor in training and residency but the program also gets to value at you for what you would look like in that role so with all those things on my plate of knowing that those had to get done before i could even apply for emergency medicine i went ahead and just said let's pretend like emergency medicine is going to be the field for me let's go ahead and sign up for away rotations and apply for away rotations and i got accepted to an away rotation let's try to coordinate your sub internship let's try to meet with faculty and prove that you're interested in emergency medicine and get some letters of recommendations already cooking and and then you have to go ahead and do your sub-internship before you do your away rotations. So I remember doing my one month of sub-I rotation in emergency medicine at the very end of my third year medical school, right before I started my fourth year, about a few months away before I had that planned away rotation. And I was really excited because I felt like all the dominoes were falling right into place. And the first day, pretty good. Second day, I noticed a few things that we'll talk about in this video. The third day, I said, absolutely not. This is not the right career path for me. The rest of the month, I still worked hard, but I already told them that my intention is no longer to apply to emergency medicine, I will go down the internal medicine route. Now let's break all those reasons down of what I saw in just three days that told me that this was not going to be the right career path for me. So number one is the concept of being an emotional roller coaster. The ER, depending on where you work, can be extremely busy and hectic or extremely quiet and often it will have a mixture of those throughout your shift. And so compared to when I am a cardiology fellow right now or when I was an internal medicine hospitalist, usually your day has like a standard level of chaos and then things get more hectic when patients get sick. But more or less, things are at a steady, even keel. Emergency medicine, from my perspective, was not anything like that. Your emotions go all over the roof. And this is actually the main reason that I said that this was not going to be for me, because on my third day, I remember seeing an attending. The initial first few hours was very relaxed. Patients were coming in at a smooth rate. No one was overly sick. You could give everyone the attention they needed. And then somebody very critical came in and things got very busy very quickly. And I saw an attending who was super sweet and super nice at the start of the shift. Flip a switch and essentially was yelling at staff to try to get stuff done because this patient appropriately they need the care and the attention. But that emotional switch that I saw in this attending from super nice to just being a little on the border side of being mean to get stuff done, something that I told myself I would never want to be in that position where my job would force me to possibly sway my emotions and my character, really not going to be the best environment for me because I can understand
understand how that person can come out, especially when patients' lives are on the stake. And so I learned quickly from that month that I wanted a field where things would be even keel, or at least you can expect where the chaos will come from in emergency medicine. You have no idea if that next patient that's coming through the emergency room is going to be straightforward or critically ill. Number two is the concept of algorithms and checkboxes. Now this is because the ER tends to be a high litigious kind of area in medicine, particularly in the US, where you're always asking, did everyone do the right test? Did the person who took care of me, this physician, did he think about all the right diagnoses? Did he think about all the scary stuff? Because you never want somebody to come to the emergency room for something that looks maybe intermediate to low risk, send them home, and then something really bad, like a heart attack, a stroke. Because as a physician and as an emergency medicine physician particularly, you never want somebody to come to your ER with something that looks like it's a medium to low risk complaint. Feel like everything's okay, send that patient home, then just to find that that patient had a critical terminal condition or perhaps they had bad lab abnormalities that you didn't pick up or you didn't order the right test to catch you know, a blood clot or a heart attack or a stroke. All of those things are kind of misses that you just simply can't have. But because of that, the emergency medicine becomes kind of a list of checkboxes and algorithms you almost have to do, not because your clinical gestalt makes you want to order specific tests, but you just don't want to get burned by not ordering it because somebody may say, why did you not order this on this patient? It could have been positive. So on the flip side, as a cardiology fellow, I will get calls for our patients in the emergency room where you can see that it's the same set of labs that are ordered. And I even remember when I was a medical student, we used to have a template or a checklist where people could easily just check in the x-rays, the EKGs, the CT scans, the labs, knowing that not everything truly applied to that patient. And so I completely understand why my ER colleagues have a lower threshold of ordering something, knowing that I really wanted to prioritize the diagnoses and the management of patients, just ordering labs, knowing that not all of them will change your plan or management of that patient, something was not that exciting for me. Number three is the concept of shift-induced jet lag. Now in the ER, compared to a field like medicine or like family medicine, where you're working predictable hours, your shifts are variable. That is one of the beauties and attractiveness of emergency medicine, but also one of the setbacks. And I know on my month of my sub eye rotation, the schedule that I was given would be something, for example, I would work from 2 p.m. to 10 p.m. The next day I would be required to get there at like 7, work till like 3 or 4. The following day, I may be working a night shift. Your schedule would be flexing. You may have a day off randomly in the middle of the week where you're catching up on your sleep, or maybe start at an early shift and then go back for an afternoon shift the following day. It was really hard to set up a schedule outside of work because the majority of my time was thinking about how I was going to sleep to count for the next shift that was coming up. And I can only imagine that after 10, 15, 20 to 25 years of having this unpredictable schedule, you get pretty monotonous in the field of ER. Number four is the concept of unsatisfying conclusions. Now, there are some emergency medicine doctors that truly go into the field because they enjoy the diagnostic ability that comes with being the first person to see a patient, very minimal history of any history at all, doing the workup and then coming up with a list of diagnoses. And so that part was interesting. But the part that I realized is that sometimes you would order a test and be like, oh, this patient looks like they have something in their GI tract. They should get admitted for a possible infection. GI needs to see them. They're going to get admitted to the medicine service. But you may not ever hear back from what that patient ultimately had. Do they have Crohn's disease? Do they just have a nasty bacterial infection? Do they have fluid? And like what was found? Do they have cancer? And sometimes that conclusion where you know ultimately you have to hand a patient off to the next in line, whether that's the medicine doctor, the surgery team, the ICU team, you may not get that ribbon or the knot tied in the story that you started to create. And if you don't have a process of keeping up with patients or talking to your medicine colleagues that you transfer the patients to, what happened to a specific patient, it can be very unsatisfying because you do the initial grunt work, but sometimes you just have to move on to the next patient in line and you don't get to enjoy the reaps of your rewards of saying, okay, ultimately, well, what was the diagnosis? And I knew from a personal side that if I was going to start a puzzle of that patient's clinical diagnoses of their management that as a medicine doctor had much more opportunities of kind of finishing that puzzle or at least knowing what the next phase would look like. Now before we get back to the rest of the episode, let's quickly talk about today's sponsor, which is Picmonic. If you're on your medical journey and you haven't had much luck finding an all-in-one resource that can help you learn the material that you need for your classes, your rotations, as well as help you quiz and test to build that long-term retention, the Picmonic may be exactly the resource you've been looking for. And one of the most unique aspects about Picmonic has to be their story-based videos, which combine these fun, memorable, and silly images to help you remember specific features of a disease or a treatment. And when I say videos, I mean tons of them with endless playlists that you can sort based on the class you're currently taking, the board exams you may be prepping for, even the board resource you're learning from, such as first aid for step one, or even the rotation that you want to honor. In addition, they have very simple and effective ways to quiz yourself, such as their daily quiz feature, which allows you to continue to stay sharp on your past topics that you've learned to make sure you achieve mastery, plus so much more. So once again, if you're on your medical journey and you haven't had much luck finding that all-in-one resource that can help you learn and master medicine to make the entire journey a lot less stressful than Picmonic may be a great resource for you. So if you're 
interested in learning more, there'll be a link down below in the description. And our friends at Pigmonic have also been nice enough to include an extra 15% off for our audience members for those of you that want to give them a shot. So if you want more information or want to get started with Pigmonic, click that link down below in the description. And of course, thank you to Pigmonic for being today's sponsor. Next for me was the uninteresting procedures. Now I know I may get a lot of flack for this because uh, yes, emergency medicine doctors do get to do a lot of variety of procedures, but at least in my month, the procedures that are commonly exposed to were things like doing basic stitches. So I had somebody who had a chainsaw injury to their calf and the tendon was cool enough to let me stitch that up for about an hour because it was a big cut. I was able to do some incisions right above somebody's eyebrow from the fall that they had, some other basic ones around people's hands. And so stitches were cool, but I can only imagine after 10 to 15 years, they're no longer that exciting. I was able to see my attendings also do common procedures like a dislocated limb so if somebody had a dislocated shoulder or a finger or like a kneecap they were able to pop that back in and it's pretty straightforward and also you may see some procedures that may be a little bit icky if you're not interested in that so I'd find people that have like really nasty skin infections and we'd have to do INDs in them and put little mini drains and again procedure somebody has to do but it's not something that I would get excited to be called for routinely and have something to be part of my job description and then finally the one thing that I was always sent as a medical student to do is that if somebody came in with that eye injury we always wanted to make sure that they didn't have like a corneal abrasion so I was always made to put the drops in and do the UV wood lamps and make sure that they didn't actually have any types of abrasions in their cornea from whatever they had their injuries from first few times it was pretty cool eventually got to the process where it just like became cumbersome of actually getting the procedure to be right as the brand new med student doing it and so all those procedures were not something that I'd be like well if this is something I had to do a majority of the week and it came through would I be excited to do so and the answer personally for me was no next is the concept of pain now we talked about the emotional roller coaster, but this one's a little bit different. The emergency medicine can be a very hectic place, and if you work at a very busy institution, that is going to be a constant for the entirety of your shift. And because people and patients are always coming in and leaving and new updates are coming back, it is very easy to miss things. It is very easy to catch yourself where you're moving on to next patient and somebody who you've been triaging and waiting for labs to come up is now decompensating or coding. And as a medicine doctor who comes to the emergency room to see a patient, I see this routinely where somebody who looks like they're stable is now crashing and then their entire triage system changes. And for somebody who likes a sense of control of saying, between this hour to this hour, I'd like to see my patients from this time to this time, I'd like to work on orders and consults and stuff. As a medicine doctor, that was really enjoyable. Knowing in the ER, none of that is fair game. A patient could crash at any point. A new sick patient could come from the helicopter, could come from the ambulance bay, could come from your waiting room. At any point, you just have to be ready for the chaos to happen. And with all of that, things can get missed. Somebody who had a lab come back an hour ago may not be caught because you're caught in this busy room and this patient who's coding. And that ridiculous pace of just having to be on top of everything while also knowing that sometimes you're not able to because other patients may require more of your attention that is where it kind of gets really crazy and then finally is the concept of long-term stability and respect now i tried to find a solid number for this and i couldn't but the range of how often emergency medicine doctor worked really interested me and i feel like the numbers that i was often seeing was anywhere between 15 and 25 years which is a pretty broad range in medicine let me know in the comment section if you are and you are and how long you've been working but i wanted to see that number as be as high as possible on average because that meant that people who were going into that field tended to stay in it. So simply seeing the fact that there are a group of ER docs who are working 15 years in clinical heavy duties and then tend to transition to more admin responsibilities to kind of offset their clinical times at least gave me a sense of pause of saying, is this something that I want to do? And knowing that the people who have been doing this for so long are choosing to step away. Next, I would always think about burnout. Medscape released kind of a happiness and burnout survey in 2023 and emergency medicine doctors that was surveyed found that about 43% on average thought that they were burnt out. And then finally, the third pillar of this is just your ability to be respected as a physician. The hard part of being an emergency medicine doctor and something I was able to see in that month is that because the patients don't necessarily think of you as their primary care physician, you often don't get to build rapport with the patients unless they're somebody who constantly comes to the emergency room. On the flip side, it also leads patients to not trust your judgment or give you the benefit of the data where you're thinking. And I've seen it multiple times where I've been called as the cardiologist or the medicine doctor because a patient or a family has kind of essentially stronghold themselves to want to be evaluated by somebody aside from the emergency medicine doctor. And as an ER doc, you are trained in a variety of concepts. And so even though that's true, especially if you're telling them that you're good enough to go home, just follow up in clinic with so-and-so doctor, it may take pause to say, I don't feel comfortable and I'd like to see the medicine doctor, the cardiologist, the GI doctor, the surgeon now before I go. And trying to navigate all those things where you're giving recommendations to the doctor, but the patient only semi-trust you is very tricky, especially when you know that you're not going to be building a long-term relationship with many of these patients. And then one final bonus thing that I realized actually after my one month rotation,
mentioned in emergency medicine, was that the emergency room does become a fancy and expedited need for primary care. Especially here in the United States where our system is very broken, where the access to primary care can be delayed for one or two months, especially if you have a very busy clinic that your primary doctor works at. It's much easier to say, I have a headache or my stomach hurts and I don't know what to do and I can't get in contact with a doctor. I'm gonna go to the emergency room. So you have a bunch of ER docs who are taking care of simple things like medication refill if somebody's out of an important medication and they can't get in the clinic to see their doctor or perhaps they are managing simple complaints that somebody has all the time, but the patient is still overly anxious and concerned and the emergency medicine doctor's role is now to tell them nothing new has changed, your lab look great, you know, go home and follow up with your doctor. That can easily be over time an unsatisfying process that comes with the job. So those are the reasons why I personally didn't pick emergency medicine, but let's flip this because again, it is a great career path for a lot of different individuals. So I'm gonna break down the reasons and the people who I think it would be a great fit for. Number one is if you enjoy a fast paced environment. If you're somebody who's really good at staying calm during hectic and emergency situations, emergency medicine may be a great field for you. Especially if you're somebody who has ice in their veins in a setting where a patient is decompensating, then you have to be able to be just calm and composed and saying, you do X, Y, and Z, you go get the labs, you do this. So that way you can just focus on taking care of the patients. Some of the best people who I've seen who can take a step back and like think about a patient, like an internal medicine doctor, but then when things really hit the fan and they have to just be less thought and just more actions, emergency medicine doctors are some of the best to do that in addition to my ICU colleagues. And then finally, if you're somebody who's interested in a shift-based kind of career path with a good salary, then emergency medicine may be a great option for you because you know where your schedule is going to be, usually at least two to four weeks ahead, depending on the group you work for. So you know where your days off will be when you can do things like schedule appointments, which for me as a cardiologist, working usually from eight to five is very tricky because most of my time in the middle of the week is taken up. So then I have to think about weekends. Emergency medicine, you'll know you'll have some middle of the days that are free or you may be off. And so you can use those for other life obligations. And in addition to salary, according to the Medscape 2024, physician compensation is actually quite good at $379,000 for ER doctors on average. And I've seen doctors who make significantly more than this, depending on where they live and the amount of kind of demand that they have in that area for ER docs. And so for somebody who is going into emergency medicine and just doing four years of medical school and three years of residency, which is the shortest combination, um, unless you're doing internal medicine or family medicine, where it's exactly the same, you actually make pretty good money. So if you're somebody who enjoys that shift-based aspect, that if you go home, no one's going to be calling you about patients, you just get to enjoy your time with your family and your hobbies, then with the good salary is actually a great option for a lot of people. So those are the pros and cons from my own experience, but I'm more interested in knowing what you have to say. So let me know in the comment section which points that I made that you feel are wrong, which you feel like you are right on the money, especially if you are an ER doctor, a retired ER physician, or somebody who is a health provider in the ER. Let me know which of these points resonated with you and your thoughts in the comment section. Love to have a conversation with you guys. And also let me know in the comment section which specialty I should talk about next in the series of why I ultimately didn't pursue it. And I'll break down the points, pros and cons, just like we did for this episode. And if you're on your medical journey and you want all these tips that I wish somebody had just given to me on my first day of medical school, there's tons of free resources that we have for you in the description. The most popular that we have that's been checked out by thousands of students now is the Med School Success Handbook, which we are updating on a weekly basis. And if you're interested in even more of our help through things like our study courses or other courses or our study coaching programs, and those will also be linked down below in case you're interested. But if you really enjoyed the episode and want to support the channel for more episodes like this, then go ahead and hit that like button. It's really the best way to support us as well as hitting that notification bell and subscribe button if you haven't done so already. And if you enjoyed this episode, then you'll probably enjoy this episode right here or why I've ultimately left the field of internal medicine in this episode right here or why I ultimately pursued the field of cardiology. Enjoy those. And as always, thank you so much for being a part of my journey. Hopefully I was able to help you guys on yours. I'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace.